Inspiring stupidity decided to make another argument for the existence of a Middle Eastern war god that invoked quantum mechanics. He sets the measurement problem upright, but suddenly loses his sanity once he explains measurement by the measurement apparatus. Let's watch. How is it that collapse happens to one definite state when we observe? The practical way this is carried out is through interaction with a particle or system of particles that has already collapsed. One can measure a particle with the use of a measuring apparatus and interact with it. This will cause collapse through interaction because the state of the particle has been disturbed. This is a decoherence effect, and some argue this can fully explain collapse on its own. No one I know of is saying that decoherence can solve the measurement problem. Decoherence just explains why cars and other macroscopic objects don't fly all over the place chaotically. John von Neumann didn't even know about decoherence as it became known during the 1980s and he died in 1957. And solve the measurement problem. However, this doesn't really solve it, because if we were to use one particle to collapse another, what was used to collapse that particle? And the stupidity begins. First of all, I don't think that physicists today use other particles to measure the properties of other particles. I think most measurement apparatuses use photons. Photons do not have wave functions because they are massless and relativistic. They move at the speed of light. But even if I am wrong, it doesn't matter because a particle A doesn't have to be collapsed in order to interact with a particle B in such a way that the apparatus can measure the properties of particle B. When one photon is measured by another, they entangle. If one particle measures another, it inherits part of its wave function, so to speak. And that particle, which is supposed to be measuring, cannot be fully explained without what it is measuring. So you need another measuring device to collapse that initial measuring particle. Okay, IP just said himself that photons were used in measurement. So I'll take what he said and respond to that. Photons don't have wave functions. Remember this? Also, photons move at the speed of light. Quantum mechanics doesn't apply to them at that level. You would need quantum electrodynamics. But then you need something else to collapse that measuring apparatus. Uh, no. You don't because the measuring apparatus is a macroscopic object. Decoherence is what explains the appearance of collapse of the measuring device. For example, right now I'm responding to some internet idiot who thinks a field of physics studied by mostly atheists proves his Middle Eastern deity, and I'm using a laptop to do this. The wave function of my laptop hasn't collapsed, it's just behaving classically because the probabilities average out as one scales up. This creates a chain of material objects in a superposition of measuring. No, it doesn't. Which is known as a von Neumann chain. Since quantum laws are what truly describe all material objects, some other particle or measuring apparatus is always needed to collapse the next one in line. You keep going back until you get to something that would be non-local, outside the entire material system, which escapes this chain by not being bound by the same physical laws, and is able to cause final collapse of everything in the chain, which is argued to be a conscious observer, something beyond the material, with the ability to collapse the entire physical system. So this decoherence theory, the idea that physical interaction of particles in the environment will cause collapse without the input of a conscious observer, cannot solve the measurement problem. And advocates of decoherence theory openly admit decoherence alone cannot fully explain why there is a collapse to one definite state, or even derive the Born rule for that matter. Does decoherence solve the measurement problem? Clearly not. What decoherence tells us is that certain objects appear classical when they are observed, but what is an observation? At some stage, we still have to apply the usual probability rules of quantum theory. Claims that simultaneously the measurement problem is real, and decoherence solves it, are confused at best. Decoherence arises from a direct application of the quantum mechanical formalism to a description of the interaction of a physical system with its environment. By itself, decoherence is therefore neither an interpretation nor a modification of quantum mechanics. Now why would they say this? Well, many physicists, like G. Grubel, in his paper The Quantum Measurement Problem Enhanced, have pointed out initial state environmental effects cannot explain the occurrence of definite experimental outcomes. The environment lacks the ability to choose between the possibilities of the wave function and choose one to be actual. Plus, the environment is also described by the same quantum laws and has the same problems already specified. This is why Stephen Adler says, decoherence in the absence of a detailed theory showing that at least the stochastic outcomes with the correct properties has yet to achieve this status. Even preferred state, predictability, classicality, and the environment-induced decoherence, Zurich refers to the observer being involved in the ultimate collapse. 
Something beyond the physical system, not described by quantum laws, needs to initiate this final or ultimate collapse. Stephen Barr explains it like this. The observer is not totally describable by physics. If we could describe the mathematics of quantum theory, everything that happened in the measurement from beginning to end, that is, even up to the point where a definite outcome was obtained by the observer, then the mathematics would have to tell us what the definite outcome was. But this cannot be, for the mathematics of quantum theory will generally yield only probabilities. The actual definite result of the observation cannot emerge from the quantum calculation. And that says something about the process of observation, and something about the observer eludes the physical description. I find it rather suspicious that you're quoting a book called Modern Physics and Ancient Faith. That is all. So what is special about a conscious observer that the environment or the measuring apparatus cannot do? Well, apart from not being described by physical laws, the observer has the ability to put the right questions into nature and yield a result. As Henry Stapp says, the observer in quantum theory does more than just read the recordings. He also chooses which questions will be put into nature, which aspect of nature his inquiry will probe. I call this important function of the observer the Heisenberg choice, to contrast it with the Dirac choice, which is the random choice on the part of nature that Dirac emphasized. I know it's not good to judge a book by its cover, but quoting someone who is part of the Institute of Noetic Sciences raises more eyebrows than, well, this. It's pronounced Dirac, not Dirac. According to quantum theory, the Dirac choice is a choice between alternatives that are specified by the Heisenberg choice. The observer must first specify what aspect of the system he intends to measure or probe, and then put in place an instrument that will probe that aspect. In quantum theory, it is the observer who both poses the question and recognizes the answer. Without some way of specifying what the question is, the quantum rules will not work. The quantum processes grind to a halt. The interaction chain stems back from an observer's ability to make a Heisenberg choice, which derives a random Dirac choice back from nature. This is how we get one actual outcome from the possibilities of the wave function. Only the observer has the ability to choose, give a Heisenberg choice, between possibilities. Non-conscious measuring devices cannot. John Gribben and Paul Davies say in their book, The Matter Myth, the observer plays a key role in deciding the outcome of the quantum measurements. The answers and the nature of reality depend in part on the questions asked. This was a metaphor at best, but I'm going to quote your friend Anton Zeilinger. He says in the highlighted text, Following our discussion, it is clear that it is the experimentalist who decides which observable to measure. He can decide, for example, whether to put a detector into the interfering paths or not. The role of the observer has led to numerous misunderstandings about the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. Very often and erroneously, a strong subjective element is brought into the discussion, implying that even the consciousness of the observer has a role in the quantum measurement process. One has to be very careful at this point. And I'll link the article from which this was taken in the description box. They were, of course, building off of Niels Bohr, who once said in reply to Einstein, To my mind, there is no other alternative than to admit that, in the field of experience, we are dealing with individual phenomena, and that our possibilities of handling the measuring instruments allow us to make a choice between the different complementary types of phenomena we want to study. Denying the observer plays a fundamental role simply doesn't make sense, and the majority of physicists realize they have to accept this. A recent poll demonstrated that over 50% of physicists accept the observer plays a fundamental role in the application of the mathematical formalism, but then only 6% accept any physical role, which means they accept the math tells them one thing, but deny the philosophical conclusions from that math. Yeah, that's maybe because of the fact that it's up to the engineer or the scientist in the room to decide which property to measure, but the measurement doesn't change reality itself like was mentioned in my last video. There's a, there's a mathematical procedure called the Fourier transform in, in which you change that time series to a frequency spectrum. And that often turns out to be a more useful representation of the signal because it can tell you what bandwidth you need and your detectors and so on. Anyway, anybody, anybody who's had any familiarity with, with uh, electromagnetic signals uh, will see that. And all you're doing is you're changing your description of it. In one case, it's a particle-like description, your time series of pulses, let's say. 
In the, in the other case, it's a wave-like description when you're looking at a, uh, a frequency uh, spectrum. But the description doesn't change the thing being described. Exactly. It's just more called that complementarity. There's two complementary ways you can describe phenomena, either, either as a particle or as a wave. That doesn't mean it's a particle in one case and a wave in the other case. In fact, there are experiments now that you can do uh, like the double slit experiment that is supposed to be something that you use to measure wave property, but you can, if you do it with accurate enough equipment, you can measure individual photons, particles, so you can have particles and waves in the same, the same experiment. They're, they're the same phenomena. It's a single phenomenon that's just described uh, mathematically one way or the other, measured one way or the other. You measure one thing where you emphasize one thing or you, you measure... Uh, you, you, you want the position of the thing, so you're measuring a particle property. But if instead you want the frequency of the thing, then you measure a wave property, and there, it's just the two different aspects of the same phenomenon. Mm. Just so you make the, the scientist or the engineer who's doing this is making a conscious decision to describe it one way or the other. Suppose you're taking a photograph of a chair. You can take it from one angle, and you can move and take it from a second angle. But it's still the same chair. Same okay. chair. Math itself doesn't tell you anything philosophically in regards to quantum mechanics. I would even venture to guess that they didn't even mean mathematical formalism, but rather experimental formalism. The fundamental role of the observer is even harder to deny with the experimental confirmation of the Koch and Spector theorem in 2011. This shows that the outcome obtained by an experiment crucially depend on how the experiment is done, meaning we are not passive observers. Outcomes are happening based on what we input into nature. As one paper explained, the Koch and Spector theorem states that non-contextual theories are incompatible with quantum mechanics. Non-contextuality means that the value for an observable predicted by such a theory does not depend on the experimental context. So when we perform experiments, we are not just passively observing how nature progresses, but are actively affecting what the outcome will be by how we observe things. As they say in the New Scientist magazine, the values you obtain when you measure its properties depend on the context. So the value of property A, say, depends on whether you chose to measure it with property B or with property C. In other words, there is no reality independent of choice of measurement. So the Koch and Spector theorem directly demonstrates the outcome depends on what we experimentally put into it. As Anton Zellinger says, The Koch and Spector theorem talks about properties of one system only. So we know that we cannot, assume, to put it precisely, we know that it is wrong to assume that the features of a system which we observe in the measurement exist prior to the measurement. Not always, I mean in certain cases. So in a sense, uh, what we perceive as reality now depends on our earlier decision what to measure, which is a very, very deep uh, message about, about the nature of reality and about our role in the universe. We are not just passive observers. Again, I refer you back to Anton Zeilinger's quote here. Note to all watching, popular science magazines can be very sensational. From our perspective, there is no reality of the system because of the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics. It's only after a measurement is made that we have a definite measurement value for an observable to work with. Let me ask you a question, IP. Given your non-materialistic metaphysics, would you say that P-zombies are possible? If that's the case, would you say it's possible that P-zombies could perform the exact same experiments as people like Zeilinga? Just something to think about. Einstein, Bohr, de Broglie, etc., the founders of quantum mechanics, is that they're all dead, and they've been dead for many decades, and we know what's going on much better now than we did back then. They were inventing quantum mechanics, and occasionally they toyed with the idea that somehow consciousness had something to do with the fundamental laws of quantum mechanics. Now we know better. We know how the laws of quantum mechanics help explain how electrons move in the brain, and there's take, take, nothing take in there. Take 15 seconds and tell us why quantum mechanics has been brought up by your opponent, why that has relevance here. Well, it's, I can only quote uh, MIT physicist Scott Aronson, who says, as far as he can tell, quantum mechanics is confusing and consciousness is confusing, so maybe they're the same. 